I have fought against white domination. And I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the idea of a democratic and free society in which all persons will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an idea for which I hope to live for and to see realized. But my Lord, if it needs be, it is an idea for which I am prepared to die. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pool to pool, 
I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears, looms the horror, looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years, finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Wakato, wakat wakato, boom fane wakato, wakat wakato, muto rapukul wakato, wakat wakato.
Ya kodo nwale mesebeko. Sa mzugu. Ya mzugu tempele mzugu. Ya sa manyele. Ti ya manyele. Ti bam manyele. Ti zim sampame. Pili kukonga li tenye. Of nanti kasura ftore. Unwe suti zim dari. Tempele mderi. Unko sa mbato bukwa ya bato bulele ntas bamba. Bernele yinga.
impossible for me to be here today. I therefore have placed the remaining years of my life in your hands. Hallo stad Schouwburg. Dit was dus de plek waar die beroemde woorden werden uitgesproken op 11 februari 1990 door Nelson Mandela. Hij is er een beetje bij vandaag zoals je kunt zien, want ze hebben een standbeeldje op het balkon van het stadhuis neergezet. Het enige wat ik niet begrijp is dat op de foto's die ik altijd heb gezien, was het alsof Nelson Mandela heel hoog op een heel hoog balkon stond, waardoor die natuurlijk ook nog veel groter leek. Maar als je hier kijkt, ja, het is maar een hinkstapsprong vanaf straatniveau. Dus hoe zat het nou? Ik was er niet bij, maar wel Matilda van Toera, activist. You were here, right? Yeah. Then they. Yeah. Yeah, so, so where was he? Was he was he here or was he up there? I think he was there where the statue Sandy. But for me it's it doesn't matter if he was there or if he was there. You was here. And you were here. <laughs> And I was here. Yes. Was it a, a good speech? Was it an exciting that, that speech? Was, or was you... It was wonderful. Yeah? People hung on to every word he said. I mean, people were so awestruck. They couldn't believe that here's this man who just came out of jail and he's talking peace. You know, he had that, uh, uh, that in him where he can calm people. I mean, I don't know how many people here were, but he brought that calmness where people just wanted to listen. People couldn't believe. Nobody shouted him down. Nobody was just listening to him. So upon release from prison on 11 February 1990 and on his election as president of South Africa on 9 May 1994, Nelson Mandela addressed the nation here. But look, somebody has written here no good. Now we're 29 years old later, right? And not all the beautiful words have come through. People talk about corruption, the Jacob Zuma time, you know, the companies that are, state companies that are being... How, how, do, you, how do you feel? Was this speech, did it raise the expectations too much? Should Mandela have done more? Should the ANC have done more? <laughs> No, the ANC did what it set out to do. It did for the lives of the people in the country. Yeah. That was the most important thing. But a lot of, lot of things have been stolen. There's been a lot of corruption. Yes, I do agree with you. But I think our new president is dealing with those things. And as soon as people deal with that, then it will, it will, it will come better. It will become better. Dealing it's with it, loss. it's not a loss, but dealing with it, yeah. If we know people are doing wrong, we deal with them, you know. Wijze woorden van Matilda van Toera op de Grand Parade in Kaapstad. Terug naar Amsterdam, terug naar de stad Schouwburg, namens ons allemaal hier. Goed ik jullie. Dit was Bram van Meulen voor de Nelson Mandela lezing in Kaapstad. Goedemiddag, dames en heren. Deze tijd vraagt om lenigheid. Maar dit is maar tijdelijk, hoor. Dat is een nieuwe heup en heup doet leven. Maar die lenigheid heeft vooral te maken met de veranderende opstellingen. Eerst zoveel hoop en dan zoveel bitterheid. En niet alleen in Zuid-Afrika. Kijk, dat is al een mooi begin. Maar dat is geen incontinentie, maar een glas. Ik kan er ook wel bij. Uh, Jezus. Mandela, zagen we, de verzoener. Hij kreeg onder zijn presidentschap de meest progressieve grondwet van Afrika mee, voorbereid door zijn fellow ANC-leden. The Rainbow Nation als sociaal laboratorium waarin officieel weinig plaats was voor woede en afrekening. Wie herinnert zich niet hoe Mandela 
na de eerste vrije verkiezingen het presidentiële paleis in Kaapstad betrad, waar het personeel, het witte personeel, beschaamde bureaus opruimde en dozen met persoonlijke spullen vulde. Mensen die onder de apartheidspresident, velen, maar onder andere de laatste PW Bota, die groot krokodil, hadden gewerkt. Mandela riep het personeel bijeen en zei, blijf. Wij kunnen niet zonder jullie ervaring. Hoe voorbeeldig, hoe bovenmenselijk, maar waar bleef de woede? Die ging ondergronds bij de Verzoening en Waarheidscommissie. Ja, zeiden veel witte mensen in Zuid-Afrika, zwarte mensen kijken vooruit en niet achterom. Zou het echt waar zijn? Hoe gingen wij in Nederland om met vernedering en bezetting? We hebben decennia lang de moffen die hier vakantie kwamen vieren de verkeerde kant op mogen sturen. Ima geradeaus. Tijdens de Interlands Nederland-Duitsland stak de haat gelegitimeerd de kop op. In 1993 stuurden honderdduizenden Nederlanders aanzichtkaarten naar de Bondsrepubliek toen een Duitse racist een Turks hotel in de fik had gestoken. Ich bin beuze. En nog maken we de borreltafel grapjes over snauwende Duitsers. Hoe maakt een Duitser een oester open? Sofort afmachen! U kent ze wel. En de zwarte Zuid-Afrikanen verzoenen en slikken hun verdriet en vernedering. Die maken geen grapjes over witte mensen. Een maand of twee geleden mocht ik een paar colleges geven aan de Universiteit van Kaapstad. En ik zag daar de leuzen nog op de muren gekalkt. Roads must fall. De diamantmagnaat die Afrika van Cape tot Cairo wilde beteugelen naar zijn inzichten. En daarvoor werd het standbeeld van Van Riebeek beklad. Ook zag ik leuzes voor gratis onderwijs. Fees must fall. Even science must fall. Een t-shirt zag ik. Fuck white people. Ik hield mijn mond en deed als white privileged person een stapje terug. Sison Kim Simang, die u zo gaat horen schreef over de woede van haar jonge zwarte landgenoten. Ze is een origineel denker, essayist, columniste bij de site van de Zuid-Afrikaanse Daily Maverick. Schrijfster van het autobiografische Always Another Country. Herinnering aan haar jeugd als ANC-kind in ballingschap. Ze werd grootgebracht op een dieet van communistische propaganda en radicaal Afrikanisme. En ze zocht het licht in de schaduw van haar vaders revolutionaire idealen. En haar moeders opofferingen. Maar Simang groeide op in Zambia, Kenia, Canada. Studeerde politicologie in de Verenigde Staten. En vond als jonge student meer inspiratie bij Malcolm X en Steve Biko dan bij de martelaar Mandela. Na de bevrijding ontwikkelde Simang een eigen stem en keek met een blik van buiten naar haar eigen land. Naar haar geboorteland. Een blik die ze bestendigt omdat ze nu in Australië woont. Maar die afstand weerhield haar niet oog en oor te ontwikkelen voor de boosheid en de haat in haar geboorteland. Misschien beschreef de woede op de campussen van KwaZulu en Fort Hare. De haat op de in de fik gestoken scholen in Fuwani. En ze analyseerde de spanningen tussen mijnwerkers, oproerpolitie en de rol van de schatrijke zwarte elite. Ze toont aan dat de bereidwilligheid tot compromissen niet heeft gebracht wat velen hadden gehoopt. Handje klap met het zakenleven leidde te vaak tot corruptie, ook binnen de gelederen van de partij. De armen profiteerden te weinig van schijnstabiliteit. Het geduld was op. Radicale standpunten wonnen terrein. Compromis is een vloekwart geworden onder betrokken studenten in Zuid-Afrika. Maar ook elders in de wereld klinken dergelijke boze stemmen op, versterkt door sociale media. Vergun me een ogenblik de kaart van boosheid groter te maken. Groter dan Zuid-Afrika, want ook in Europa en elders in de opkomende economieën worden we geconfronteerd met radicale stellingnames. Hoe ga je als welwillend en geprivilegeerd burger daarmee om? In de zeven jaar dat ik in Parijs woonde, bezocht ik de wijk in de banlieue. Waar het smeulde van de haat. Waar, als je Ahmed of Fatima heet, het schrijven van een sollicitatiebrief geen zin heeft. 40% van de jonge mensen tussen 18 en 27 in de sociaal fragile buitenwijken is al jaren werkeloos. Wie een kleur heeft, moet gemiddeld zeven keer per dag zijn kaart identité laten zien. Gevolg, een smeulende boosheid. Die ze nu en dan oplaait tot intense haat tegen politie, tegen instituties 
tegen het Westen. De in de buitenwijken populaire rappers hebben genoeg stof om de witte voor alles en nog wat uit te maken. De nazaten van de gekoloniseerden laten steeds duidelijker van zich horen. Wie het ongenoegen van de gedecoloniseerde wereld in breder verband onderzocht en duidt, is de Indiaanse historicus Pankaj Mishra. In zijn boek The Ruins of Empire, The Revolt Against the West and the Remaking of Asia, beschrijft hij hoe het Indiaanse subcontinent, China en Japan, maar ook delen van Afrika, 150 jaar kolonisatie hebben ervaren. Mishra blies het stof van geschriften van geknechte denkers, journalisten en radicalen, En liet zien hoe zij de Victoriaanse tijd hebben ervaren. Want voor het Westen was dat misschien een tijd van voorspoed en zelfvertrouwen. Maar door de geknechte Aziaten en Afrikanen werd die tijd ervaren als een catastrofe. Pankaj Mishra las publicaties van lokale geleerden, schrijvers en politici. Geschreven tijdens het koloniale bewind. En hij laat zien hoe ontvankelijk wel opgeleide jongeren nu zijn voor de destijds onderdrukte nationale aspiraties. Wat wij weten over de aangerichte vernedering in de koloniën komt veelal uit westerse bron. Wij hadden onze multatudie, de Britten Ryers Kipling. Maar wij zijn nauwelijks bekend met de Oosterse en Afrikaanse filosofen, journalisten en politici die uiting hebben gegeven aan de koloniale vernedering. Ik zal u de citaten besparen. Op één na van de dichter Ramindrat Tagore, Indiaanse dichter, die als essayist de verschillen tussen Oost en West haarscherp wist te verwoorden. Ik citeer, wij moeten ons verenigen en ons oordeel vellen over het Westen. We moeten onze stem vinden en verheffen om te kunnen zeggen, u mag zich opdringen in onze huizen. U mag onze toekomst dwarsbomen, maar wij zullen uiteindelijk over u oordelen. We judge you. Het zijn vooral de anti-westerse geschriften die jonge, felle Indiaanse studenten nu inspireren. Zij moeten niet veel hebben van een verzoener als Gandhi. In hun ogen is Gandhi een sell-out. We judge you, schreef Tagore. We oordelen over jullie. Ik hoor een echo van Tagore in het werk van de gekleurde Zuid-Afrikaanse dichteres Ronelda Kampfer. Zij schrijft in het Afrikaans de taal van de onderdrukker. De, en dichten over de ontvangst die ze met haar gedichten vond bij de Afrikaner elite, die voorheen nauwelijks schrijvers van kleur toeliet. De dichteres beschrijft hoe ze de labels uit haar goedkope kleren knipte en probeerde haar tekort aan kunst en cultuur zo te verbergen. Ze weet dat ze nu goed genoeg is om deel uit te maken van die stelsel. Nou zit ik om een tafel met mijn voorouders, mijn voorvaders, ze vijanden. Ik knik en groet bedachtzaam. Maar ergens diep binnen mij weet ik waar ik sta. Mijn hart en kop is oop. En zo is goed opgevoede mensen lach en eet ons saam. Maar ergens diep binnen mij weet ik waar ik sta. Kampfer geeft stem aan de jongeren die zich steeds sterker afkeren van de verzoening tussen wit en zwart. Zoals die onder Mandela werd uitgewerkt. Te veel onrecht bleef te lang etteren. Confrontatie is nu de tacht. Tactiek. Minder Mandela, meer Winnie. De jongste generatie ziet dat de infrastructuur van de apartheid nauwelijks is veranderd. De witte werden alleen maar rijker. Ja, witte worden nog nauwelijks in staatsdienst genomen, maar als zelfstandige blijken ze zich beter te kunnen ontplooien dan ooit. De kolonialen worden letterlijk van hun sokkel getrokken. Beelden die de wereld rondgaan, passend in deze Age of Anger. Ook een titel van Pankaj Mishra. De voorheen gekoloniseerde wereld confronteert ons met een ander wereldbeeld. En nu komen de nazaten van de vertrapte met hun verhalen en films en essays. Zo ook in Afrika, waar een denker als Achille Mbembe afrekent met het in zijn ogen brokkelend fort Europa. Hij presenteert Europa een prettige rekening voor het geweld van kolonialisme en slavernij. Van een werkelijk humanisme kon nooit sprake zijn, vindt hij, omdat het werd bedorven door een verzwegen, ingebakken racisme. Een racisme dat nu alle vluchtelingen, asielzoekers, migranten, moslims en andere minderheden raakt. Europa trekt zich volgens hem terug in een politiek van vijandschap. Ook in Nederland breekt het ongemak naar buiten, getuige de discussies over slavernij en Zwarte Piet. Wat doen we met Jan-Pieterszoon Koen, de slachter van Banda? 
dienen we Indonesië niet veel meer te betrekken bij het onderzoek naar Nederlandse oorlogsmisdaden tijdens de Indonesische vrijheidsoorlog. En hoe brengen we het slavernijverleden in beeld van de man die met een buste geëerd wordt in zijn met bloedgeld gebouwde pronkvesten, het Mauritshuis? Hoe zwart maken we het cultureel centrum Witte de Wit? En moet je nu wit zeggen of blank? En dan de debatten over roofkunst. Ja, Indonesië en Afrika eisen hun hier tentoongestelde schatten op. Artikelen over culturele appropriatie verschijnen. Mag een kunstenaar lintje buur spelen bij een andere cultuur? Mag ik een Afrikaans stem geven in mijn werk? Krijg ik als white privileged person niet meer kansen dan een zwarte? En ga ik niet aan de haal met zijn of haar cultuur? Lastige vragen, pijnlijke discussies, want zelfcensuur kijkt om de hoek. Het onderwerp kleur en kolonie vinden we ook terug in talloze essays over witheid die de laatste jaren in Nederland verschenen zijn. Dutch Racism van Filomena Asset. Hallo Witte Mensen van Anusha Nzume. En White Innocence van Gloria Wekker. Een belangrijke studie over ingesleten witte vooroordelen. Zo nuttig dat er over gepraat wordt. Zo vanzelfsprekend dat mensen voor hun geschiedenis opkomen, hun eigen verhalen vertellen en zich niet langer laten koloniseren door de al te fortuinlijke. Voer dat debat. En tegen ouderen, op krukken lopende stakkers zoals ik, die pleiten voor bruggen bouwen en compromissen, zeg ik ook tegen mezelf, laat je niet leiden door angsten. Volg het debat, sluit je er niet voor af, erger je. Ergernis is heel gezond. Het is het middel tegen dementie. Het houdt de geest lenig. En of we het nou willen of niet, het is een kwestie van eigen belang. De Global Village is minder wit dan we dachten. Slechts 9% van de wereldbevolking is wit. Maar het traditionele Westen doet net alsof de hele wereld wit denkt en wit twittert. De globalisering heeft onze economie een andere kleur gekregen. We zullen thuis, in ons hoofd, in onze cultuur, meer ruimte moeten maken voor andere mentaliteiten, andere godsdiensten, andere oorlogsherinneringen, andere ideeën over schoonheid en beschaving. The empire will strike back. De stemmen en standpunten zullen verharden. Zonder radicaliteit, geen verandering. Kom maar op. Natuurlijk ben ik bang dat de nuances verloren zullen gaan. Dat we te veel denken in slachtoffers en daders. Maar naast het pessimisme van het intellect is er ook nog zoiets als het optimisme van de wil. Ik wil in de goede afloop geloven. En dat pleidooi voor een goede afloop houdt voor u nu Sisonke Msima. Sisonke. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Amandla! I greet you all in the name of Swate Piet. <laughs> He asked me to give you a message. He said that after 200 years, he's a little bit tired, and he would like to retire. He says he never liked kids. <laughs> he said he never liked kids. He hates noise. He hates street carnivals. He wants to be left in peace. He said he is considering suicide. So he wants the Dutch people to leave him alone, please. <laughs> so, so I want to thank uh, Zam very much for the, the honor of, of, of bringing me here and inviting me for this inaugural lecture. Um, your commitment, Bart, Lawrence, um, Monique, your commitment to sharing African stories in African voices for the Dutch public is um, unparalleled and it is incredibly important. So I thank you. So let's begin at the beginning. Like millions of South Africans, my own story is deeply tied to that of Nelson Mandela. It begins with my father. Inspired by Nelson Mandela, he joins the African National Congress. In 1961, he's not yet my father, I was not born that long ago, 
he slips out of the country and begins his life in exile. He travels to Russia and he undertakes military training. He travels around Africa doing revolutionary things. He thinks that he will only be gone for a year, and so he never says goodbye to his parents, my grandparents, because he is under strict instructions. He is 21 years old when he leaves the country, and when he returns and touches South African soil once again, he is 53 years old. And during those 30 years that my father was gone, he was very busy. He met a woman in Lusaka in the 1970s, and she became my mother. They had three girls, and I am the eldest of those. I grew up in many different African countries, part of the ANC community in exile. We sang freedom songs and about Mandela and Sisulu and Becky and all of those who were fighting so bravely for our freedom. As kids, we didn't play cops and robbers, we played communists and cadres. <laughs> I owe my sense of self-belief to that community, to the adults who I grew up with, who taught me that I was as good as anyone else in the world. I was 17 years old when Mandela was released, and it was like a dream come true. My family, like many others, was able to return because of the changes that began to happen in those years in the early 1990s. And so other than my parents and immediate uh, members of my family, no one did more to determine my destiny and shape my life than Nelson Mandela. His decision to start Mkonto Wesizwe triggered my father's leaving, and his decision to begin the process of negotiations triggered our family's return. And so this is why I am especially pleased to have a chance to reflect on the father of the nation. I am here to pay him tribute, of course, but also to give voice to some of what troubles me about how he is viewed today. Today, Mandela is at the center of a big debate in my country about reconciliation. Many younger South Africans suggest that Mandela may have made too many compromises. 26 years into the new era, there is this lively, angry, often chaotic debate about the role and place of the father of our nation. A few years ago, when the protests began on university campuses across South Africa, some students accused Nelson Mandela of betraying the revolution. They called him a sellout. The elders were alarmed and angry and hurt, but the young ones were completely convinced, as young people tend to be. And I am of the generation that lies between the two. I was not old enough to fight for freedom myself, but I am certainly old enough to remember Mandela and to have studied him. And so I know that he was no sellout. But I do agree with one point that my younger compatriots make. The revolution was betrayed. I do not place the blame uh, at Madiba's feet for that betrayal. The blame for that lies squarely with the generation of leaders who followed him, my parents' generation the freedom fighters whom I respected and loved in Lusaka and Nairobi, they returned home, as we all did. They put down their guns, and they picked up their spoons, and they began to eat. And many of them have not stopped eating since. There are only a handful of them that I can think of who I would trust with my future. And so although he was a loyal and lifelong member of the ANC, Nelson Mandela was also a pragmatist. He once said, you must support the African National Congress only so far as it delivers the goods. If the ANC does not deliver the goods, you must do to it what you have done to the apartheid regime. Now, we have elections coming up in April, and I think how South Africans choose to vote is their own business, obviously. But I think how we remember Mandela 
is very important. And that, in a sense, because of who he became and who, what he meant to so many people, is everybody's business. He was a man whose life was totally dedicated to removing oppression and restoring dignity. And yet, when we talk about Mandela today, we focus almost exclusively on his message of healing and forgiveness. If, if Pope Francis were to decide to name Nelson Mandela a saint, I don't know, I'm not religious, I don't know if you can even do that. I guess you have to have been a Catholic, anyway. I have no doubt that he would be called the patron saint of forgiveness, yeah? Today, forgiveness is seen as the central component of Mandela's legacy. And I must confess that this irritates me greatly. This excessive focus on forgiveness, I think, diminishes Mandela's political legacy and it blunts his power. Those who embrace what Bishop Tutu called the Rainbow Nation, that forgiveness narrative that is so closely associated with South Africa today, put white people at the center of the frame. Over time, as the story of our transition has been told and retold, in the popular imagination, it has become a tale of forgiveness rather than a story of justice. It has been told as though Mandela loved white people so much that he was prepared to forgive them, regardless of their collective sins. This, I think, is a perversion of the truth and a distortion of his political legacy. The truth is, of course, that in his 75-year career as a leader and an activist, Mandela never wavered in his commitment to those who had been the greatest victims of apartheid, and that was black people. And I think it's time that we put for forgiveness back into its proper place. It has a place, but I think it's important to put it back into its proper place in the story of South Africa. Because when you look at Mandela's life and his approach to problem solving, you see a man who was both principled and pragmatic. Madiba was always prepared to throw away an idea or a theory that did not support his main cause, which was not forgiveness, but the liberation of black people. So while he became a committed and wonderful champion of forgiveness, it's very clear that if forgiveness had been standing in the way of justice, if Mandela had believed that forgiveness was being used as an obstacle or a blockage, as an excuse for maintaining oppression, I think he would have very easily stopped advocating for it. So I'm not saying that forgiveness is not good or important, but I am saying that it cannot be reduced to the only strategy, indeed, the only story about South Africa. What concerns me, of course, in this, is that forgiveness takes up all of the oxygen in conversations about South Africa because it appeals to white people. Talk of forgiveness helps to ease white fears and anxieties about black rage. And these white anxieties always seem to supersede black people's pain and black people's need for justice. And so if we think about the long history of unfair race relations in this world, this is an old theme. This idea that white people seem always to be very sympathetic to one another's pain, more so to one another's pain than they ever are to black people's that there is this unconscious tribalism, as though the empathy muscle can only be activated deeply when it's white feelings at stake. And so I want to suggest to you that this idea of Mandela, not as the commander-in-chief, chief, as the, the people in America say, but as the forgiver-in-chief, is not benign. It's not meaningless that it is, in fact, quite dangerous. And I don't blame Mandela for this. This mythology was not of his making, but I think it ties into already existing, deeply held beliefs about what it means to be black 
and what it means to be white. So in the years since apartheid ended, the story of Mandela's forgiveness has taken on this life of its own. You might say that a cult of forgiveness has emerged, with Mandela as its unwitting high priest. The prophet Mandela has been reduced to a caricature of himself. And this hijacked Mandela is a commodity. Today, you can find Mandela on teacups and t-shirts. The other day, I saw online Madiba leggings for sale. I should have worn them. Mandela, of course, is especially loved by my fellow white South Africans. Indeed, in South Africa, there are many white people who have never hosted a black person in their home, who have never had any social cause to really engage much with black people, who have pictures of Mandela on their walls. They love Mandela's smile. They love photos of Mandela with children. Indeed, he may be the only black person many of them know. Whenever you do something that these kind of white people don't like, they are quick to tell you that Mandela would never have behaved like that. <laughs> the Mandela that these white people love is a reasonable black person. Mandela is never angry. White South Africans love Madiba the way that white Americans love Obama. They have turned him into a saint and a teddy bear, a totem for peace and good vibes. This love, however, does not seem to translate into real-life actions. Mandela, Che Guevara, Gandhi, incense, and ums. Mandela, I think, has become the chai latte of revolutionaries. <laughs> so you know, chai is one thing, right? We know that chai is tea. It has, a, it's a scented, sp uh, spiced, Beautiful tea, it has a long history. It is tea. And then, <laughs> a latte is coffee, right? It's another thing. Different bean, totally different, right? With a different history. But somehow, there's this marketing invention called a chai latte. And it's an invention straight from the mind of a young executive somewhere in Seattle who has never been outside of America. It is sweet, it is drinkable in small doses, but it is totally full of empty calories. If you really want to take it far, you, you could order a chai soy latte. And so watching the chai latification of Mandela, I came up with that phrase myself, makes me sad and sometimes it makes me angry because it, it represents this dramatic simplification of his legacy and this profound misremembering of the man. It makes him, it makes us forget about the freedom fighter and the intellectual giant who he was. And so I want to talk tonight about how we might rescue Mandela from the cult of forgiveness. Join me as I put on my cape how we might restore him to the dignity of maybe black coffee rather than chai latte. There are two ways I think we can accomplish this. The first is to remember his love for Winnie Mandela. And I want to close that gap that has been created between them for reasons that I understand, but that ultimately do more damage than good. Because Winnie forces us to complicate the frame, to remember Mandela the radical, to insist that they were more alike for many years than they were different. And I think the second way we rescue Mandela and South Africa from this cult of forgiveness is by, remembering, by reminding ourselves of his genius, which was that Mandela managed to hold this tension between political principle on the one hand and political compromise on the other. So let's begin with the hard stuff, which is winning. Those who want to cast Mandela as a saint find it difficult to reconcile the fact that Mandela loved her because she was implicated in violence and corruption and all of those issues that are the opposite of what he stands for, yeah? So over the years, as Mandela's image has become more identified with forgiveness, 
there has been this gradual erasure of Winnie Mandela because the association is seen as toxic. It's not a good look. And yet, of course, it is impossible to write Winnie out of our story and out of our history. And it is even more difficult to write her out of Madiba's heart. There is nothing more poignant than reading his description of the first time they embraced, 21 years after he was sent to prison. Until that point, he had not even been allowed to touch her hand. And then all of a sudden, they were allowed into the same room together with no glass wall between them. And he says that he held onto her so tightly that all he could hear was the sound of both of their hearts beating. I want to remember how much these two sophisticated, brave African souls loved one another. And then, after she was found guilty of participating in the abduction and assault, which led ultimately to the murder of a young boy, in 1992, Mandela wrote, quote, as far as I was concerned, verdict or no verdict, her innocence was not in doubt. I don't say this to make Mandela look bad. I say it for the opposite reason, to remind us that Winnie wasn't some tragic mistake in his life. He loved and defended her. I also invoke her spirit and her memory because so many women in South Africa loved her. She inspired us with her anger and her defiance. Women could relate to her because she was every woman, because their own husbands were also far away, in the mines or in the cities. And like her, they struggled to manage against forces that were far bigger than them. And yet she was always there, a constant, ungovernable presence, not afraid to shout at the police to put them in their place in a way that many black women in South Africa never felt able to do. These families, these women who loved Winnie and still do so today, they are not stupid and they are not evil. You can't simply dismiss them because they admire someone who, like many other people in our damaged society, participated in unacceptable violence. At the same time, you cannot wish away Winnie's participation in that violence, because to do so would be to dishonor and disrespect the victims of that violence, those boys who were caught up in her recklessness in those terrible years. Yeah? So those who find Winnie's actions intolerable uh, don't like to hear this, but I think we cannot change this. It is better to accept, to accept it, to accept Madiba as he was, to accept that many of South Africa's heroes were both courageous like Winnie and also flawed. They deserve respect for their courage and revulsion for their crimes. But if we are expected to understand and to forgive racists who engineered apartheid, then surely we can extend some empathy to Winnie. Ultimately, I think what I'm saying is that you can hold the contradictions that Winnie presents in your head and in your heart, that you must, in fact, hold them together at the same time because they are part of the South African story. When we try to tell smooth, easy stories about South Africa, lovely stories about Nelson, we keep bumping into Winnie and the countless others whose stories were both told and not told at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So as you know, the TRC was the mechanism for forgiveness, uh, and it was well known and widely talked about globally. And I have many critiques about the TRC process. It's easy for us to critique when we're standing on the outside. But there's no question that for a brief moment under the extraordinary leadership of Nelson Mandela and under the auspices of the TRC, the nation examined its past and the ugly truth about what had been done. Today, those who are obsessed with forgiveness forget that many questions, though, were not resolved when the TRC ended. They forget that most apartheid leaders said that they didn't know what had happened. They forget that hundreds and thousands of documents went missing and were burned and, um, what's the word, shredded. 
during that time. They forget that only one person ever served time for apartheid era crimes, Eugene de Kock, one person. Everyone else walked away because they said they didn't remember or they didn't know what happened. So we were supposed to be healed by the TRC, and it is hard, I think, for the world to accept that for all of its efforts, the TRC was an incomplete, uneven, and often devastating process. And that at the end of it all, not enough remorse was shown by white South Africans collectively, and by those in particular who were responsible for carrying out crimes against humanity under apartheid. For most people, regardless of their color, remorse is a precondition for forgiveness, yeah? When I tell my kids when they're fighting and I say, say sorry to your sister, yeah? And he says sorry, and then only can she say it's okay, yeah? When the final TRC report was handed over in 2000, some black people had forgiven those who had hurt them and other black people had not. This has to be okay. It has to be accepted. White South Africans will not die if they do not receive the love from black people that they think they deserve. White people in all contexts where historical wrongs have been carried out must learn that black people's lives do not center around their feelings. This is a difficult thing for many white people to understand. Mandela knew that you must deal with painful matters openly, but it is true that he was anxious to push us in a particular direction towards forgiveness and reconciliation, and I understand why. The situation was volatile. The threat of violence was real. But once again, this is where the narrative betrays us. The threat was of white violence more than black violence. It was whites who had the military power. It was whites who were angry about losing that power. And it was whites who had a history of cruel and violent behavior towards black people. So Mandela's approach of addressing white anxiety was strategic. He wasn't just in love with white people. He was managing them. He wasn't terribly afraid that black people would drive whites into the sea and rise up and slit their throats. Those fears lie in the white imagination. And Mandela was a black man who knew very well that black people were unlikely to do that because we hurt one another. Black people hurt each other. Very rarely in the history of humankind have black people risen up in retribution against what has been done to them, yeah? So I can't fault Mandela because he was right. He understood that white capacity for violence. Across space and time, those instances where black people have killed white people in retribution are vanishingly rare. The instances, of course, where white people have killed black people simply for existing are abundant, ever-present. Madiba preached forgiveness so that nothing would stand in the way of black people's freedom. When Madiba was a young boy, he and his friends were trying to ride a donkey. The donkey did not like this because donkeys are not horses. They don't want to be ridden. And so when it was Madiba's turn to jump onto the donkey, the harassed animal bucked and it threw him off. And Mandela fell into a thorny bush with scratches all over his face. So when he stood up, he was very embarrassed. The donkey had made its point and it had beaten him. But Madiba never forgot how it felt. He never forgot the lesson. He understood in that moment that you can beat your opponent without humiliating him. He integrated this into his thinking, and time and again, when our country needed cool heads and generous hearts, Mandela was able to go back to the simple lesson. So let's talk about how he applied that. In 1993, F.W. de Klerk was the then state president. He and Nelson Mandela were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah? People remember that? 
many people in South Africa, I can, I, you can already tell what I'm going to say, were rightly irritated by that joint award. I continue to be angry about it. It is true that de Klerk took many important actions that led to the dismantling of apartheid. He took a risk and he held a referendum in which whites in the country were asked to vote on whether or not to end apartheid or whether to continue. And 69% of them voted yes. So I'm still looking for those 30%. So 69% of them voted yes to negotiating the end of that evil system. Yet as Madiba pointed out later, and I quote, this is his words, not mine. I wish I could do the Madiba voice. De Klerk did not make any of his reforms with the intention of putting himself out of power. He made them for precisely the opposite reason, to ensure the power of the Afrikaner in the new dispensation. Okay, Mandela was woke. So while de Klerk was prepared to end apartheid, in Madiba's estimation, and I quote him again here, he was not prepared to negotiate the end of white rule. Yeah? He was happy to negotiate the end of apartheid, but that didn't mean that he wanted to negotiate the end of white rule. To this end, many of you who are old enough will remember that around the time of the transition, there were a series of horrific massacres that took place under de Klerk's watch, just as the negotiations were beginning to unfold. De Klerk never explained or apologized for them. It enraged Madiba, he confronted him numerous times about this issue. Mandela knew that de Klerk was not his intellectual or moral equal. Yet Mandela said, and I quote again, I never sought to undermine Mr. de Klerk for the practical reason that the weaker he was, the weaker the negotiations process. To make peace with an enemy, one must work with that enemy, and that enemy becomes your partner. He took the high road, so he used the Nobel speech to make sure that de Klerk would not turn back, that he would finish that last mile. Mandela was not going to let his ego or the facts get in the way. If he had rebuked the Nobel Committee and told them that he was offended that a man whose security forces were killing black people should share the award with him, it would have damaged de Klerk's credibility. Mandela needed de Klerk to shine in order for the country's process to have legitimacy. This to me illustrates that Mandela was not motivated by sentimentality. He didn't love de Klerk, he didn't even like the guy. His actions were propelled by two things, a clear vision of the end goal and a pragmatic approach of how to get there, including a willingness to compromise on issues that did not matter, like who got a prize and who didn't. Yeah, I would have been fighting with the clerk and not accepting the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and I would have thrown away the whole thing. In 1985, Mandela was moved away from his comrades in Polesmore prison. He was moved onto a different floor. And he wasn't allowed to see them without applying for an official visit. Imagine that. So you're staying in the same prison. You want to see your friends who live on a different floor and you have to apply for a special permit, and they visit you like visitors, okay? So they might as well have been in Johannesburg. That is how hard it was for them to see one another. So he was lonely, and he missed his friends. He had been able to talk to them whenever he wanted, and now, for the first time in years, that contact was gone. But then he decided that he was going to look at that situation as an opportunity. He said, and I quote, my solitude gave me a certain liberty, and I decided to do something that I had been pondering for a long while, to begin discussions with the government. My solitude would give me an opportunity to take the first steps in that direction without the kind of scrutiny that might destroy such efforts. Mm. This was a risky move. The apartheid regime had repeatedly said that they would never negotiate with terrorists and communists. And he was clearly a terrorist, even though he wasn't a communist. 
Similarly, the ANC had long asserted that there was nothing to talk about with the government until it had unbanned the ANC, unconditionally released political prisoners, and removed the troops from the township. These, these were two sides, and both of them had dug in their heels. So there was an impasse. He could see that if no one moved forward, millions of black South Africans would be trapped. Neither side would back down, and neither side would ever win. So technically, the decision to open talks with the regime could only be made in consultation with Lusaka and with his fellow comrades. And yet, Madiba decided to act on his own. He says, I chose to tell no one what I was about to do. I knew that my colleagues would condemn my proposal and it would kill my initiative before it was even born. There are times when a leader must move ahead of the flock. Ever the pragmatist, he also knew that this would be the only time that the ANC would have plausible deniability, right? So he wrote, my isolation furnished my organization with an excuse in case things went wrong. The old man was alone and completely cut off, they would be able to say, and his actions were taken by him as an individual, so they could deny him. It's very smart. So he was protected by what he referred to as a period of splendid isolation. And he was able to use that isolation to protect his movement, but to give him the space to remove the cloak of dogma that was blinding his comrades. With a clear vision in mind, he proposed a path of what was then called, what he ca called, talks about talks. And this, as we know, was the beginning of the end of the apartheid regime. I am here today. We are all here today because of that splendid isolation. Mandela never took his eyes off black people. He was talking to white people on our behalf. His brilliance was letting white South Africans with their fragility and their tea cozies with Madiba's face and their leggings <laughs> and their desire to be constantly reassured. His brilliance was letting them think that he was their champion. In those delicate years when a lasting peace was imminent but by no means guaranteed, Mandela was always calculating always balancing, always reassessing, and always focused on us, however you choose to interpret who us is. He made concessions and he changed plans when necessary, but he never conceded on any issue that would compromise the end goal, that South Africa would become a country where every person would have a vote, regardless of skin color, and where the will of the majority would determine the leadership and the direction of the country, a country in which human rights would be respected. This, in Mandela's mind, was the key to dignity. He was steadfast and he was systematic once the negotiations started. He stayed principled and he made compromises. Today, we live in a world where politicians refuse to make compromises and where they have no principles. Mandela had both. He was an expert at both small kindnesses and grand gestures. And the fact that South Africa is not equal today is not Nelson Mandela's fault. The fault lies with those who took his political legacy and squandered it. It lies with those who took his belief in political compromise as a sign of weakness rather than strength. Mandela did not forget, worship forgiveness. He treasured dignity and freedom. So in conclusion, I think it's not just societies that are considered to be in conflict that need Mandela. There is so much polarization across Europe and America. White nationalism and xenophobia are rampant. In Brazil and India, hatred is on the rise, and a cruelty and mean-spiritedness is on display everywhere from social media to the halls of power. And so we need Mandela today in all of those places, not to preach about forgiveness, but to lead the way towards crafting political solutions in places where people are paralyzed by fear, by dogma, and by self-righteousness. 
Here, too, in the Netherlands in the last few days, I have seen that you need Mandela. I have spoken to friends in the black community and to activists who are organizing to make this society more just, less defensive, more open. And there is a lot of work to be done to address discrimination in this society. You don't use the word segregation, but its fingerprints are all over. Clear in the housing layout of this city. You don't call it discrimination, but when I hear about young people who apply for jobs, as I did yesterday on my visit to Southeast, knowing that they will not be called back because their name isn't Dutch, I have no other word for it. In this country, you do not need Mandela's message of forgiveness. Please. I mustn't catch any of you talking about forgiveness and Mandela anymore. You need Mandela's skills. Black and white people in this country and in all the countries on this European continent would be wise to study the old man's life because from him you will learn how to reach across the racial and economic and religious divides that are keeping you apart. You will learn to do this not on the basis of sentimentality, as you can see, I'm not sentimental, but on the basis that the future must be met together or not at all. Mandela's greatness must be taught in your schools, not as, not as a story of forgiveness, but as a story about power, principles, pragmatism, determination, and yes, that word which everyone in the world seems to reject these days, left and right, compromise. Political compromise does not mean allowing racism to thrive in a weaker form. It means outlawing discrimination even as we accept human fallibility. I want to imagine that this is a society, this one here, in which all equal citizens of all colors can sit around the table and agree to time frames and clear plans so that those who celebrate Suarte Piet can do so privately and not at the expense of tax-paying citizens, black and white. Black people pay taxes, right? And the municipalities are the ones who are busy paying for this parade, right? So changing the frame of the discussion so we talk about what's public and what's private. The Mandela so many of you love and respect in this room today would expect that Dutch people who fought so hard to free him would not use public resources to deny their fellow black citizens the rights to dignity and safety and opportunity. <laughs> there can be no justice, no lasting peace without people who, like Mandela, are willing to move beyond restating their positions towards reaching agreements. If one man in a damp prison cell at the tip of the African continent, isolated from his friends and separated from his wife and his children and his people for decades, if that man can change the history of his nation and inspire us all, then just imagine what all of us who are free can do. Those of us who hope for a better world have an obligation to move beyond us and them, beyond dogma, and towards one another. We must do this not because we love each other, but because we need each other. When we walk towards the other who we fear, the other who we hate, the other who we do not understand, we do so because we know that there has never been any other way to end oppression. In the world in which I want to live, peace and justice are king and queen, and forgiveness is but their humble servant. I thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> well, please come. Thank you so much for your very wise, wise words. It was moving, it was poignant, and I was sitting there watching you and uh, well, all the experience you had and the great writing you do just ended in this great speech. It's also the beginning of uh, a tradition. That's why I want to give you something special. Mm. There's a very beautiful um, stamp made in a unique edition, thousand. It will cost Dutch, among each others, always talk about money, 20 euro. Okay. And you get it for free. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but. All the other people are going to buy it. I thought you were going to say 20,000 Yeah, we, that's what we hope to get, to, to, to start with the tradition of a yearly uh, Mandela lecture. Mm. It is based on a, a watercolor of Malin Dumas, uh, whose drawing, she made it in 2005, is based on a picture of Elie Weinberg. We saw it in the beginning mm. as a young uh, Mandela in the dock. And, the painting was, I think, trust, do would you trust this man or something? But well, then here he is. We trust him. We love him. Uh, that is the. Um, it's it's made by uh, Rata Janssen. That's his designer. And I also tell you that uh, Rata Janssen made something very special. You can visit here in the hall. It's a kind of uh, digital uh, apartheid experience, which you will find out there. It sounds a bit sick, but nevertheless. Um, <laughs> Digital uh, experiences can be thrilling and painful too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Accepted that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone. For the times they are a changing. Come writers and critics who prophesize with your pen And keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again But don't speak too soon, for the wheel's still in spin There is no telling who that it's naming For the loser now will be later to win All the times they are a change Come senators and congressmen, please heed the cause. Don't stand in the doorway, don't block up the halls. For he who gets hurt will be he who gets stalled. There's a battle outside raging. It'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls for the time. and fathers throughout the land and don't criticize what you can't understand your sons and your daughters are beyond your command your own road is rapidly aging please get out of the new one if you can't lend a hand for the times they are a change The light that is 
strong the curse that is cast the snow one now will later be fast as the present now will later be past the order is rapidly fading and the first one now will be later to win for the time Come gather round. 